how many hours of film did you have to begin with to, <coughs> that you had to cut down to less than two hours? So what was the sort of triage? We, uh, we filmed 75 interviews, and the interviews were extremely long. Uh, almost all of the interviews were at least an hour, and some of them were up to six hours long. Uh, we filmed Charles Morris and Nuria Rubini for, I would say, at least, at least five hours each, and uh, Elliot Spitzer for almost three hours. And, and I have a lot of regrets, actually, about, I, you know, I, I wish the film could have been 12 hours long, because <laughs> a lot of the things that Elliot Spitzer said, a lot of the things that the Prime Minister of Singapore said, um, uh, were very, very interesting, and it was very painful to have to cut them. You could redo it as a PBS series. <laughs> <laughs> this has been suggested, but I, I unfortunately, or maybe it's, maybe it's my salvation, I just don't think that I could handle doing that all over again. <laughs> Once was enough. So, so let's switch to No End in Sight. So just to remind people, No End in Sight was Charles' first documentary, and it covered decisions leading to the war in Iraq and the consequences of those decisions. Uh, so first of all, of course, something very dramatic just happened in that world in the last two days. Uh, and taking that into account, do you now see an end in sight? Uh, an end of a certain kind. Um, luckily, uh, there is you know, very luckily for the world, uh, there is, to some extent, a mistake in that film. No End in Sight ends with a kind of implicit prognosis that Iraq's descent into chaos will continue unabated. And in fact, Iraq has stabilized to a certain extent. It has stabilized, you know, in, in a way, stabilized only in a very relative way. I mean, it still is an extremely violent, utterly corrupt, terrible place. But at least, you know, many people, in fact, I, I would say the majority of people who looked at the situation in 2006 uh, when the film was being made, um, felt that it was irretrievable, that, you know, we, we were going to see something that was going to look like, you know, at best the warlord period in China and maybe could look like, you know, Rwanda or something like that, where you could see, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people dying and a, and a country just completely bereft of infrastructure, or maybe something like the, the decay of the Congo or, you know, uh, and that didn't happen, uh, it, partially because the Iraqis themselves pulled back from the brink and partially, I have to give him uh, credit for this. President George W. Bush, uh, I'm sure he wouldn't put it this way, but the, the reality is that he eventually began to realize that he had made a series of disastrous mistakes, and he started uh, doing something about them and behaving differently. And General Petraeus uh, deserves an enormous amount of credit also for the way that he handled that period. And, and so now Iraq has stabilized uh, as a really nasty, messy place but not one that's going to completely disintegrate into chaos. I don't know if that helps you a lot. But. So do you, do you think that the uh, assassination or murder of, of uh, Osama bin Laden two days ago will be a sufficiently cathartic experience for America that we can transition in Afghanistan and withdraw? I don't know. That will be a very interesting thing to see. Um, uh, I, I hope that President Obama will use the political capital he's thereby gained well. Uh, I am not close to the situation in Afghanistan. I, I do spend time with people who are, and I have to say I hear from them an extremely wide uh, range of views. And, uh, uh, about many things, not just about the question of whether we should stay or leave, but where Afghanistan is at, whether it's possible to change it, uh, the importance and significance of the Taliban, whether they're advancing or retreating. You know, if you talk to Peter Bergen, who I have spoken to recently at great length about this, you get a very, very different answer than you do from George Packer or, you know, many other people. Um, I just don't know. So let's come to a more general subject, uh, social media documentaries. So 
Do you see documentaries as uh, effecting social change? Uh, and also given your entrepreneurial background with technology, can you comment on the growing phenomenon of social media as a tool for social change? Uh, I hope documentaries can have an effect. You know, uh, n not that that's the only reason that I make them. You know, I, 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 of course, do make them in part because I think it's a good thing to uh, provide in information to people about things that I think are important. But I, I hope this isn't a terribly shallow thing to say, but making movies is just so much fun. Yeah. Uh, What's it? It's, it's just really like being Chancellor of Berkeley. It's just fun all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Right. It, it, it is. It's a weird thing to say. I mean, you know, we uh, making No End in Sight, for example. I mean, th there were times when the editors and I uh, would break down crying, um, and and a number of the people that I dealt with in the process of making that film uh, subsequently were killed, and. So, you know, obviously about a very, very grim, difficult, and, and uh, another friend of mine uh, whose film was competing with mine, was also nominated for the Academy Award this year, was recently killed in Libya, Tim right. Hetherington. Right. Um, and Tim, you know, was, he, he loved a good party, and he loved a good drink, and he was very good looking, and he knew it. And, uh, uh, you know, he was a very alive guy, and so, hearing that he got blown up was not fun. But at the same time as that's all true, and, and Tim would have said this and did say this when he was alive, at the same time as that's all true, there is nothing more interesting in the world than, uh, to me than taking a bunch of material about a situation like that and trying to turn it into something that is coherent and compelling and that people will watch. It's, it's an utterly transfixing process. Uh, just to flatter you, actually, very few people do that well. So I think it's an incredible accomplishment on your part that you two well. times in a row have taken such you know, complex subjects and you know, made them so uh, dramatic and so compelling and so moving. Uh, thank you. But, uh, I, I'm not sure that I agree with you that very few people do it well. You know, one, one sad thing, an unfair thing about the world of film and the world of documentaries in particular is that there are so many fantastic documentaries that so few people see. Um, there are very complicated reasons for that. I don't pretend to understand them entirely, but you know, to take one example, how many people here have seen or even heard of a film called Manda Bala? Manda Bala, which is Portuguese for send a bullet. Uh, it's it won the grand prize at Sundance in the year that my first film was at Sundance. It is a ridiculously brilliant film, absurdly brilliant film. And it looks gorgeous, and the music is incredible. And it grossed $125,000 in the United States. Wow. Yeah. OK. So since we're at iHouse, uh, to finish up this part of uh, the dialogue here, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, how your iHouse experience and the principles of iHouse have sort of contributed to your future life and most especially what you've been doing most recently. Well, in the first place, you know, once again, I just had a blast here. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a fantastic time. Uh, the place was full of really smart people, um, extremely irreverent people. <laughs> um, very unconventional people, and also, it, it, you know, it, it was a very eye-opening experience for me. I, I come from a very parochial background. Uh, my my parents, my family were extremely poor, and also I was uh, I was physically handicapped for a number of years in my childhood, and so when I came to Berkeley, I had had very little exposure to the rest of the world. I had, I had never traveled outside the United States. In fact, I'd done very little traveling inside the United States, some, but not much. And I was this very, you know, in my head, shy, bookish, nerdy, quiet, you know. And uh, Berkeley in general, and I House in particular, uh, yeah. began changing that. Yeah, we're, good at, we're good at curing that here at Berkeley. <laughs> uh, well, you did it. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, and then in in more serious ways, you know, I uh, I was here uh, during the Yom Kippur War, um, and the place had a lot of Israelis, and it had a lot of Egyptians, and a lot of Jordanians, and uh, and many of the Americans were Jewish also. And you can imagine that during the Yom Kippur War, there were a number of frank and open exchanges of views. Uh, I remember almost seeing what almost became, you know, a very serious fight involving a couple of dozen people um, in the, the, the Great Hall. Uh, and, and that was a very interesting thing to see. Uh, and it was very interesting to talk to both sides, which I did. And that began a very long, very gradual process of opening my eyes, a process that is very far from complete. Hmm. So. Uh, thanks.